everyone. <laughs> Welcome to this amazing uh, YouTube live stream. And I'm joined by some special guests. And I can't wait to... Um, chat today um so i've got two special guests and jen so let me introduce them um for starters uh mum on the spectrum swinging. taylor hello taylor welcome hello orion thank you woodshed theory Glad to be here. it's the one and only claire from the woodshed theory claire hello you, everyone friend? hello thanks for having me and us and neurodivergent is here yes <laughs> hello jen <laughs> I like your fidget behind you, Jen. That um, somebody else showed me one of those earlier this week. I've never seen those before. Super cool. This is how I stay regulated while I'm talking, and I have used this in every single live stream or interview that I have done. So it's good. It's stuff. very stimmy to even look at. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. This is how we do it. I honestly can't watch it anymore. I've got to turn it. <laughs> I can't believe this this worked. I'm so stoked it worked, and I'm I'm so glad we're here, everyone. Um, and you know, the great thing about it is um, we've got people joining us from all our channels on this massive live stream. Uh, the, oh, the I'm chat so room, excited! It's ridiculous. the The chat room is a little uh, overwhelming. There's lots of comments and stuff. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for for Whitney and Spicy Autistic for uh, helping us uh, moderate. Thank you, the moderators. Chat thank you, moderators. We it's appreciate you. It means a lot, and it's great to have everyone watching. Now, um, this is a live stream that's never been done before for us, so f a, a, a four-way channel live stream. So if you haven't checked out everyone on the screen, you saw it here please first. do. Please do. So check out um, everyone's channels. Um, and uh, Jen, um, Neurodivergent, I know you're on a flip phone from the 80s, so is there anything you wanted to say before you dropped out? <clears throat> um, enjoy my 8-bit presentation. It, do you have a actually, tape deck over there? <laughs> yes, who doesn't? I'm going to make my mixtape out of this. <laughs> my, I miss all my, my cassette favorite tapes. songs. I used to have a Spice Girl cassette tape and an InSync cassette tape. It's like so dumb that I got rid of them. Like that is so dumb that I don't have them anymore. <clears throat> you remember uh, video recording your voicemail message to the radio and like you would like stop it so that people could like leave you a voice message or like whenever you were trying to make mixtapes back in my day, we actually had to record it off of the radio and the DJs right, were always yeah. talking over it. Yeah, like DJ, DJs like Orion were always messing it up, you know? I don't think I know that. Did you have a music show, Orion? Was yeah, it, so I was definitely the like person I, I didn't that would, know if it was just talk show or if it was something else. No, no, I was definitely was the music? person that would talk um, that would talk over your songs when you were recording. I'd come in okay. at the end and go, hey, yeah, yeah, TLC, Waterfalls. Um, yeah, so um, the, that's not how I talked, by the way. Um, but yeah, I, my um, primary... In fact, you know what, Claire, my only career was in radio. I haven't worked in an office. My only career was in radio from when I was like 17. Um, and yeah, I, I was, was on referring music radio. to your new career as content creator. Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking about the, the stuff you didn't know about. Um, but yeah, um, <laughs> I was in radio um, as a job, so on a music yeah, radio. How long did you do that, Orion? Um, uh, uh, probably about a decade. Um, and then I, then I started to get, um, I don't know, HR blocked and my, I guess, my undiagnosed autistic self started to be labelled as not a team player or can't play well with others mm. or just not very good. And then I started to, yeah, that was about that. Um, <laughs> I never really recovered, unfortunately. Um, but I was never, I was never unsuccessful um, and I really loved it. Um, but yeah, I guess it was tricky trying to navigate undiagnosed and, and um, my reactions, if things weren't, didn't go right or were un, you know, they obviously were disproportionate and I didn't know why. So obviously I was just a bad employee. Um, <sighs> but yeah, I mean, I worked in music radio and some of the biggest radio stations in Australia. I worked in Sydney and Perth and Melbourne and, and you know, working on music radio stations um, in Australia is probably, um, when I was doing it, it was probably a pretty awesome job. Not so much these days anymore. Like, I mean, there's who listens to the radio anymore? I don't know. Um, but yeah, so it was like my life pretty much, and I pretty much got taken away from me because I was um, too autistic without knowing I was. 
Hmm. I think yes, it's so that's... interesting to hear you talk about your career in radio because that's something that like nobody could ever think that an autistic person could do, you know? Hmm. And you've talked about it before that that was one of your special interests. Like you literally kind of reverse engineered a radio <clears throat> transmitter, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. when you were very, very young. And you talk about how you were able to kind of like sit in a box and not really interact with other people. And you had control over who you talked to, who you didn't talk to, etc. cetera. Um, yeah. So just another great presentation of like, you know, uh, uh, things that could make people not understand what careers you could do as an autistic person, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. When I was about 13 or 14, I made an, an FM wireless bug. Um, I soldered it myself. It's like a little microphone and a little solder. And, and um, basically, you get your friends in the neighborhood to tune into a frequency on the FM thing, and they'd hear me talking and they'd play songs and talk. But yeah, so radio, I think, is a classic job for someone like me. I sit in a box by myself for six hours. I play music and talk to, to people that I can't see or hear. And I only have to take the calls when I'm told there's a competition now, you better take the calls. Um, and I can hang up on them and I can edit them. Like I can actually have a conversation with a listener and then I edit it before I put it to air. Um, so it's, it's um, in fact, when you think about it and look back, you can go, well, that's how I can slip through the keep up because everything I do can be made in a, a you know, in perfect environment. So it is really, it is really interesting. Taylor, you're a really fast typer. <laughs> I love to type. It's very stimmy for me. <clears throat> like ever since we had, um, goodness, what was it called in, in middle school? keywords maybe we had a program and it that was like my life like how many words per minute can i type and mm -hmm. uh, i i love to type i love it yep i love that about you the original I just learned link works thing. for some people that's what i understand yeah anyway yeah it's weird technology is so weird and i'm recognizing Somewhere. so many familiar names in the chat so thanks everybody for coming so nice yeah, to see everybody see um, Jenna, I can't remember. I was just thinking that about how many words can I type a minute. It's over a hundred, but I can't remember. Um, I, I checked it like a year ago and I can't remember what it was at, but I, I love to type. I wow, type that's lot. really a lot. That's a lot of words a minute. Let's talk autism stuff. <laughs> okay, let's do it. What's up? Hey everybody, welcome. But I had a question come in and it's kind of like, in tune with something I wanted to ask y'all as well. So question about when you are at your happiest. But my question to go along with that is like, when is one time when you've felt, cause I know we deal with masking a lot. Like when is one time you can look back and think like, that was, that was, I felt really a lot like myself in that moment. I, I have to think about that, Jen. You can go yeah. first if you have an answer. Okay, I'll go first because my um, I, I always try to go with my gut instinct and my gut instinct is normally um, when I feel at peace and when I feel content and um, just to make Orion a little bit uncomfortable here, but as females, you know, we all deal with like the, our, <clears throat> we all deal with cycles of life as human beings. But as females, <clears throat> we deal with like cycles of the month <laughs> and weather and like how everything is, you know, kind of going for us. But there are a lot of moments where I feel really, really peaceful and content. And when I feel those moments the most is probably when I am gardening or mm -hmm. trying to do like home study stuff um, like... Um, dehydrating fruits or vegetables for some healthy snacks or um, working in my garden or harvesting from my garden which is you know here and there in Colorado you know we don't have longer seasons for like um, harvesting stuff so it's a lot of like homesteading stuff and um, you know like cooking and stuff like that so that's when I have legitimately, like if I were just like, it's my first thought that comes to my mind is when I'm like homesteading and gardening and doing stuff like that, mm -hmm. depending on the weather outside also. And if the moon is in retrograde. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I like to garden too. I just planted some watermelon this year. I've never grow, grown them before, so we'll see what happens here in Texas with, with the heat, but definitely <clears throat> hear you yeah. on gardening. Claire, did yeah. you come up with an answer to put you on the spot? Uh, we can come. You, nobody has to answer this question. Buffering, loading. Okay. Well, I think it's difficult because I, like many late diagnosed people, well, I always think it's kind of funny because, like, I didn't know that I struggled with depression. So. <laughs> I didn't know that that was an issue for me. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought that, oh, of course I'm happy. Of course I am. Um, yeah. So I, as far as like, when do I feel like most myself, most happy? Uh, I think it's just been over this past few years of finding out who I am authentically and putting that into practice. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's like a developing thing for me. Like I continuously feel more myself and more happy. That makes me happy. More I, content. I had kind of a similar realization this past week. I was, I was helping my best friend with something and I ended up writing this letter. And when I was reflecting, I realized that without knowing that I was autistic and having the right words for my experiences, um, I just from a young age had internalized this idea that living with a very large amount of stress and anxiety is normal. And I feel yeah. like that's kind of what you're saying, like realizing, I, I think I'm happy, but like there's some depression there. And like, um, I've just realized not knowing I was autistic, I just internalized that life is always supposed to be very stressful and anxiety inducing all the time. <laughs> and so, like you said, I just, I feel like I'm slowly peeling those layers back of like, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be this way. Mm -hmm. Ryan. Okay. My answer to this question is um, a law of physics called constructive interference. That's my answer to. Did you? Was a question about happiness or something yes. like that? Yeah. yeah. And your answer is constructive interference. interference. So, does anyone know about the law of physics? The, the the physics law, constructive interference. Does anyone know about that? That's what makes me are you, happy. Are you asking us or are you asking the live chat? Everyone, you guys. Do you guys know? I. I'm yeah, gonna let no. Claire explain it. <laughs> oh well, obviously it's so easy. Are you ready? First, I mean, what did you, what did you call it? Because I think I call it something different. What I did... think you take this brightly colored paper, like there's pink, orange, yellow. Constructive like... interference. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> oh, okay. That's when um, that constructive inter interference is when you you're interfered in the middle of saying something, but it's building with a, something constructive, like road work. Definitely Stop not. Talking. Definitely not. Okay, please. Can to I just go on this? Yeah. Okay. yeah, please. Sorry. That's Taylor's <laughs> fault. Sorry, everybody. It is. I'll own it. And this, this is ahead. where people this is where um, people can just take a spell and a spell and just let me spit this out and move on with my life. Um, okay, this is actually true, by the way. This is actually the key to happiness. Uh, it's it's physically proven. Okay, so constructive interference is basically where um, two wavelengths of the same length. Okay, so we're, if we're, we're on a wavelength here, yeah, we're on the same wavelength, right? But it's when you say, oh, me and that person are on the same wavelength, it means your wavelength is of the same length. So two wavelengths of the same length that meet create double the frequency, okay? Frequency is energy. It's expelled from the body, okay? Having this conversation can either give us energy or take our energy away. I feel we're on the same wavelength. We have four wavelengths meeting of the same length. That is four times the energy that we are creating or the frequency we are creating. That's happiness, okay? And they've actually physically proven this with regards to um, physics testing. Um, they looked at love and hate and happiness and joy. What do you think creates the most... Um, frequency because it's all about Einstein said it, life is all about frequency well, if you could guess what would you say creates the most frequency the most expelled energy to other people love, love. Hate, it, joy wait maybe love. this is something related but food, I heard something food. authenticity isn't that like a really high frequency Taylor's got it in one authenticity so the frequency of authenticity Orion what's that mean scientifically it means it means being honest and actually believing it. So it's, it's someone who, who tells the truth or is honest, but actually believes what they're saying. Yeah, that's authenticity. Now, that mm -hmm. creates 4,000 times more frequency than love. 4,000 wow. times. So being with someone who's authentic creates 4,000 times more energy than love. That's scientifically proven. That's an Einstein thing. Wow. So you want to talk about happiness, when a wavelength, the same length as my wavelength, connects with me, I feel happy. I get energy. That's why 
Claire might experience this. I experience this. Some podcasts I record suck me dry. Other podcasts I like want to go forever. Right? That's yeah. that's a classic example of wavelengths meeting in frequency. So that's what makes me happy. And I'm I'm sorry to bore you and you can just talk and I'll just go quiet for another ten minutes. No, it's super interesting, Orion. I I really love that. And but it's kind of related. Like one thing that I love so much about the autistic community is I feel like we have a very finely tuned BS radar. Like we can smell BS from a mile away and we are all about authenticity. Like I feel like I have encountered more authentic, I've had more authentic experiences within the autistic community than I've had anywhere else. I don't know if y'all feel the same. Someone just said it's a load of pseudoscience to me. Um, <clears throat> let, let, let me, let me uh, address that. So it's not pseudoscience because it's physics and it was, mm-hmm. it, there was a scientific research with over 25,000 people where they actually measured um, based on all the different feelings they're feeling in their bodies experiencing. So I know I get what you're saying, but it's just pure physics. It's how the universe works. If you if you want to have you know, it's all about it's all about the um, the energy. Vibes. Anyway, it's, it's all about the vibes. It's not yeah. It's not vibes. It vi- it's vibes. It's vibes. Fair enough. Well, um, anyway. I mean, there have been some studies that have uh, shown that like cells that have been detached from a person's body can respond to like pain or anger or happiness. I don't know how they measure it. That also feels like pseudoscience. I'd like to look into it, but I'm just saying that might be along the same wavelengths. But I will say, <clears throat> I know this wasn't Taylor's specific question uh, because she kind of talked about like, when do you remember feeling happy or what activities you know, have made you feel happy? So that's why I answered my first uh, inclination. But I also want to kind of interject that um, happiness can't be cultivated from outside sources. And this is something that I talk about a lot. And so I think a lot of us think that, well, if I had the perfect job or if I had the perfect, you know, mm-hmm. house, or if I had the perfect this or that, you know, whatever the outside external source is, that I would be happy. And what we have to remember, and I think what a lot of us quickly find out, especially as autistic people struggling with the world around us, is that no matter where we go, we are still ourselves. It doesn't matter what job we go to. It doesn't matter what house we live in. Um, yes, outside things can impact your happiness. They can, you know, drain you or stress you out. But they can't. They can have negative impacts, but they can have positive impacts. Like the positive impact has to kind of come. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean to turn this into like some kind of like <laughs> Machiavellian, like uh, you know, psychology session but i think that that was a great first question to start us out with and i know that a lot of us ask for questions from our um community and i got a lot so claire Uh, did you get any um as far as did i receive any questions i didn't receive that many questions i think i received one that i remember and that was uh please forgive me i i don't know who sent it but it was about um masking and do we feel like we mask i think the question was if we felt like we mask more or less now that we have our diagnosis i think that was the question uh and my answer would be i i think less that would be my answer i think i mask less now with my diagnosis uh now even though now that i'm more aware of it uh I feel like when I, uh, if I feel like I have to, but uh, I, I don't think there's very many uh, instances where I feel like I have to. So I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I have mask less now. Taylor, when does the lawyer need it by? When's he in court? How fast are we typing here? Who, when Can you the, hear it the through judge the judge hand down the ruling? Holy shit, Taylor. I don't know why. You're killing sorry. her with the typing. Okay, I did not know you could hear it. I am sorry. I I'm was... getting flashbacks to uni here, okay. trying to study in the library. And all you hear no is more typing. Noted. This is lively, yeah? This is lively, Noted. Right? <laughs> I'm studying here. I'm sorry. What, what's this? Okay, you know, though. Oh, Ryan knows. I just got... It's a library! Sorry, I apologize. I just got a new mic. You know this, and I'm getting used to how sensitive it is, and it's picking up on everything, so it's good feedback. Thank you, O'Brien, for the feedback that my microphone is picking up. It's so positive, positive feedback. It, it's bloody sexy uh, sounding microphone. Well done. 
That's I wanted to. Yeah, that's why I. That's why I was doing it. I feel like I'm in the room with the keyboard. That's how clear it is. (laughs) No, I feel like I'm the keyboard. (laughs) Sorry, everybody, for (laughs) the keyboard sounds. (laughs) I I feel like I'm in the room. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) Okay, I'm putting it up. Bye. I'm, the keyboard is going oh, away to Oh, shit. I'll be laughing at area. that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so I think my answer it would be a little interesting in that when I first got my diagnosis, which was um, like four years ago now, uh, I think maybe I masked a little bit more because I was like how I felt like how am I supposed to be autistic? You know, it was like, now that I know that mm. I'm autistic, like what, what is an autistic person like? <laughs> and so I feel like there was this period of time where I was like, and I think there are for a lot of us where it's like, who am I actually? Who am I really like now that I am coming to know myself in this lens, through this lens? But now, yeah, I feel like um, I do kind of, uh, you know, I'm a delayed processor. So sometimes at a social event, particularly group events, I'll have this delayed reaction to where I'll process something and be like, oh, that response like didn't really feel like me. I think I was kind of masking through that. Um, but it's usually just kind of at group events that I don't have a lot of control over because I feel like I've kind of restructured my life to just interact with people that I feel comfortable with for the most part. And I can't always avoid that, but I feel a like lot of a, times I do. You know, like when you're diagnosed later, and then you're kind of thrown back out into the world. It's kind of like a baby giraffe trying to stand on its own. It's very mm-hmm. much that kind of thing where I, you just don't know what to do and you're feeling very wobbly. So mm-hmm. for me, I, it was easier to just kind of take a step back um, and kind of be more secluded. But I know not everyone has that option. Yeah, I would venture to say, um, and I actually talk about this in one of my videos, that I definitely... excuse me, unmasked a lot more after my diagnosis, but then I struggle with that um, because I've always kind of been like a uh, pick yourself up by the bootstraps kind of girl and was it what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I do think that there is some truth to that, you know, some truth to like working hard and um, adversity teaching you lessons and giving you strength. But um, then there is an obvious, you know, a negative side of that, which is um, how crappy you feel about yourself and how wrong you feel trying to navigate the world Mm -hmm. and how you feel like you're making those choices personally to be a bad person when everybody else just gets it. So um, I I don't know if, uh, how, I'm I'm still trying to find the balance myself um, because I I definitely unmasked a lot more. And it was kind of like I said, you know, like, um, is it, you know, beneficial to me or is it like, you know, I don't want to run on the treadmill anymore because it's uncomfy and I don't like it. Um, Mm. I find myself not interacting with people as much anymore and I find myself, um, secluding myself a lot more and I almost feel like I don't know how to talk to people anymore. Like, have I given myself too much grace? Um, so the, the, you know, because, so the answer to the question is yes, I've absolutely unmasked a lot more since my diagnosis. Um, when really I think the key point of what I mostly needed from my diagnosis was to know that I'm not a bad person. So if I could find some kind of a balance between still trying to interact and talk with people and to be real and legitimate and to be myself around them, um, but to also understand why I am the way that I am and maybe not be such a yes man, I think that that would be great. I haven't found that balance yet. It's only been a couple of years into my diagnosis. So, Orion. Just quickly to the 155 or so um, watching, uh, welcome again. And you guys just just dropped in. Um, welcome I'm to this so live excited. stream. Hi, everybody. Great to have you all here. If you're wondering every, what's going on, so as you can see, you've got four people on this live stream. 
You've got a Jen from Neurodivergent, so that's a YouTube channel you should check out. You've got Claire from Woodshed Theory, and you've got Taylor from Mum on the Spectrum. These are uh, three incredible uh, content creators with their own channels you should check out. What a big I know deal. we're doing it. I know we're doing it on this channel, but I just want to be clear, everyone, because it is on my channel, um, that whether you do or don't subscribe, or, or will or won't subscribe to the to you know all four of us. Um, I'm just happy that you're all here um, and now we can move on to uh, more happier times where I don't talk. <laughs> yeah, Jen, didn't you get like 4,000 questions from your community for our I, group today? I did. Are you guys ready for one? What, what's the most interesting one? Like, yeah, what's, what's the most like... random question? Well, okay, so uh, I... I ended up with like 12 really good questions and so this is a little bit nerdy of me but i actually printed out the usernames of everybody that had submitted a question and picked two at random okay you guys so i just want all of you in my community if you're here right now to know that if you submitted a question i picked them at random okay um but i thought it turned out pretty good so the first one was really short it says they want to know what special interest that, uh, and this is from Stephanie Olson, A535. So thank you for submitting your question, Stephanie. Special interests that subscribers don't know about. I've been pretty open about most of my special interests. Let me think. I find that I'm a very, I, I feel that I'm a very boring person. Like when <laughs> I started a YouTube channel, I was like, I'm pretty interesting. But then, <laughs> but then I learned that that, <laughs> That is not the case. I think you're a very interesting person, Claire. That I think is you so are too. kind. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, I, I'm like 99% sure you share all of this. Like, you, you're really great at repurposing things. You know, it's awesome to see the stuff that you recreate. Like, you find things and then you recreate them, and it's amazing. Oh, thanks. Is this an intervention? I'm trying to think of I, like something. Yeah, is it an intervention? I, I wasn't I don't invited know to this part. Um, we really like what you do, Claire. Sometimes I'll watch an anime. Oh, yeah. oh look at you. Okay. 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 Uh, I, I, um, maybe I know, like, I could have a conversation about Studio Ghibli. I don't know what that is, like, but that's great. Like, if you wanted great. to talk about, like, Miyazaki movies and, uh, his message and wow. I, I, I could talk about some of that, but, uh. Yeah, maybe maybe people might not know that about me, but I don't know how much of a like what I consider cool. a special interest. Yeah. What about you, Jen? Do you have like a secret? Yes. Okay, what's your secret? <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> um, you share it. Consider, consider. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally PG, totally safe for YouTube. Uh oh. mycology, actually. <laughs> um so I actually um, got my my husband got upset with me one time because when we went to the mountains and I saw a bunch of different mushrooms, I took pictures of them, you know, the tops and the bottoms and the stems and everything. And then I came home and you want to talk about like um, hyper focus and monotropism. I uh, literally started you know, deep diving into this my um, mycology book that I had to the point where uh, my son was asking for like, you know, can I can I get some a snack or something? And I was just like, mm hmm, mm hmm, you know, like because I, I was deaf, I was desperately trying to figure out what mushrooms I had identified in the forest. Um, to anybody out there that's interested in mycology, be careful. Don't eat any mushroom that you find. You could die. But, you know, it is something that I've been interested in for quite a while is like mycology and mushrooms and, and foraging mus mushrooms in, in the wild. So <laughs> my dream is to see an Amanita muscaria someday, which is a Mario looking oh. mushrooms. Um, and they do have them here in Colorado, so I'm desperately hoping that I will see one someday. But um, yeah, that's that's my little special interest, I guess. That's so cool. That is cool. We don't talk about deadly mushrooms around here at the moment. It's a bit of a touchy subject. Uh oh. Um, in case you ever watch worldwide news, <laughs> apart from that, we're moving on. I do um, know what you're talking about. Uh, that's all we're going to say. I do then. know. What <laughs> 
Yes. Oh man. Hey, you know, I re- I reckon the the one that I don't that provides no help to my content is just um my kind of like constant obsession with criminal investigation. Right. I just love it. I just can't get enough of it. Um, mm. Do you like watching yeah. like the criminal documentaries that kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So a hundred percent. But for me, it's like. People go, oh, you like to watch murder, do murder people do? Oh, oh, oh. Now, that's how they talk. But um, for me, it's actually the the way the investigation goes. I love that. I love the laws around investigation. You know what they can do, what they can't do. You know, watching police cross the line. Oh, that'll that'll get this guy off because how they did, how they interviewed him there. You know, different things. The kind mm-hmm. of the whole investigation process. I love that. Now there are definitely great shows. So I love access to. Um, you know, watching interrogations and stuff because, you know, learning how, what you can and can't do and get away with, I really love to see. I mean, they're just such basic, simple tricks. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, I find that fascinating. And that was, like, the only thing that I would be interested in reading when I was studying just criminal mm. stuff. But, yeah, so that's really, I find that really fascinating. That's for sure. And one more time, can you just share with us what people sound like when they talk about that? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Murder. Oh, yeah, yeah. What are you just like the murder? <laughs> what are you just dead people? Nice. Thank you. Thank Very you nice. for sharing that. I was just gonna say I have my one more. If you guys are down for it, I'm Taylor, ready. did you? <clears throat> Taylor, did you give a response to a secret? I mean, I talk about special interests a lot. I, I mean, I've talked about this a little bit, but I am really into baking. And I, it's one of those things like I don't like I don't like to brag. I, it's not I I didn't ask to be good at it, but I can make the best freaking cupcakes. Like I just I don't know. I didn't ask to be good at it. I didn't what? ask to be good at it. Like I know how it that shows, sounds. It shows it's you. It's just like I I don't like making things pretty. Like and that's I used to run a bakery out of my house, but people want pretty things, and I'm like screw it. Like I just it just needs to taste good. Okay, so I don't care what it looks like. But I will make you a cupcake that will make you slap yourself because it's so good. So slap yourself. Oh, yeah, that was pretty. Uh, that was a pretty intense way to say it. So you you, sorry you for actually that. did that as a business for a while, didn't you? Yeah, Am I, I did. Too I, much? Um, no, no, I've I've talked about it in some capacity. But yeah, I ran I ran a bakery out of my house. I've made like I mean thousands and thousands of cupcakes. Um, so I love doing it and. I, I've baked since I was little, but my specialty is like cupcakes and cookies, and I'm really into it. This past weekend, my daughter, she started watching baking shows, and she, these kids, these 10-year-old kids were making eclairs, and I'm like, I've Whoa. never made an eclair before. Shoe, I've never made, shoe pastry. Yeah, yes, pat shoe I was like, I've never made pat shoe And so uh, I didn't even know what it was till this weekend. So this weekend, we made pat shoe We made eclairs, and um, they were really good. I was really proud Did of them. Did they puff up for you? They did, and I, I'm a gluten-free baker because me and my son are gluten-free, and uh, they were freaking good all, is all I have to say. They were amazing. Well, you said so, that you've made thousands of cupcakes. Well, I don't mean to brag, but I've eaten thousands of cupcakes. Well, that's impressive, too. Yes. And you, so, you didn't ask to be good at that, Claire. You, you know. didn't ask to be good at it's that. Just, no. Some people that are born sh- that way. It shows know? me. <laughs> I know. Oh, I, I know. Um, or, autistic, uh, autistic Jenny, you might have known her as Jenny Aspie. She's moved, changed to Autistic Jenny in the hey, comments. Hey, Jenny. Um, she's just written, there's a Southern saying, when someone when something tastes so good, it makes you want to slap your mama. Is that yeah, that's real? where it was coming from. Like, is she making that up? Not is that familiar, made up? No, it's like, it's so good, it makes you want to sit up and slap yourself. Like, it's a, I've, I hear it in Texas a lot, and I realized when I said it on the live stream, I'm like, this is probably offensive to some people. I'm sorry for the trigger warning, like, uh, whatever. But yeah, it's a weird saying that you hear in the South a lot. Like, so good, you want to sit up and slap yourself, or slap your mama. It's, yeah, I know, okay. problematic. Yes. Right. So, I, 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 um... Was checking in the Facebook and stuff. There's someone asked about. Um, this is a good question from Isabel. She asked about like the consequences of generational undiagnosed or late diagnosed autistic people. The kind of impact that can have on. That's a really interesting conversation. To have given that uh, we can. Exp- so if we've got four autistic people here, and presumably four late diagnosed autistic people. Uh, some have kids that are gone on to become autistic, um, and some obviously were. Um, created by people before them. Uh, so it's come from somewhere. So, um, you know, d- d- does that, is it, anyone want to talk about that? That's a kind of interesting thought about from Isabel about this kind of the consequences of generational undiagnosis or. Jen? Do I raise my hand like I'm in school? So that lets you know Go that I, I have an answer for your question. 
yeah, looks disproportionately helpful. small to the rest of your body on this shot. But yeah, go. <laughs> okay. I have a question. I have an answer. So my dad was absolutely autistic. He would seclude himself at family functions and um, he would get angry at noises and sounds. I remember as a child growing up, he would get angry at me for stirring my ice cream in my bowl. And if I dragged my feet on the pavement, um, you know, he or if somebody behind us in line was like popping bubbles with their bubble gum, he would get very upset. <clears throat> and I just always thought that he was just like a, a buzzkill, you know, and um, I remember like sometimes before my autism, you know, I, I recognized my own autism, I would wear perfume and he would, you know, like get upset about that. And um, I just always thought that he was a buzzkill and he he's got a good family but you know when he secludes himself and he has social difficulties talking to his sister and his um brother and other people in my family they really struggled hanging out with him <laughs> they really struggled hanging out with him um so i think that there was obviously his family that didn't understand him and then there was his children that didn't understand him, right? Mm -hmm. So the generational misunderstandings, if you will, um, if I would not have understood what was going on with him now, I would have continued to have thought that he was a jerk and that he was just choosing to be unhappy. Um, mm -hmm. Even after I understood what autism was for myself, I would actually talk to him purposefully and like watch his eye contact and he could not look at me while he was talking, you know? Um, so that gave me a whole lot more understanding. So I kind of feel like there's like a stopgap at this generation, I guess, of understanding my dad when there were his family probably just thought he was choosing to be antisocial and choosing to seclude himself and choosing to be awkward and weird and irritated at noises and sounds. So I don't know if that answers Isabella's question, but that was definitely my experience. And um, once I found out probably about maybe two years before he passed away, I had a whole heck of a lot more grace and compassion and understanding for the man so hmm. yeah i have a lot of thoughts about this that i will try to condense but um i i am very interested in the intersectionality of autism and trauma and also autoimmune disease and i think uh there's so much internalized stress with autism autoimmune disease is triggered by stress um it's very intrinsically tied with stress and autism is much less um, what am I trying to say like with women it's we're just now understanding how autism presents in women so more and more women have gone without this diagnosis you know considering mm -hmm. population wise and so I think there's so much to say about when women we pass uh, you know think about me like if I didn't know I was autistic and kind of kept internalizing the stress is like I'm, I'm actually I'm talking about this in my video tomorrow uh, like I've had autoimmune disease since I was in second grade and I have alopecia and it causes my hair to fall out and I've dealt with that my whole life and I think that's one way that my stress was internalized like I didn't know how to support myself I didn't know how to uh, take care of myself because I didn't have the understanding and so those internalized stresses you know, that is passed down. Like you think about how we emulate the behaviors of our parents. We emulate the behaviors of people that are close to us and you see how they live their lives. You see how they carry themselves, how they handle themselves in stressful situations, how they take care of their bodies. And so I think that there is a significant, I mean, 80%, 80 there's something to this. 80% of autoimmune disease is found in women. And 
Compare that to what we're seeing in the autistic population. I mean, autism is highly, highly undiagnosed and overlooked in, in uh, you know, the population of women. And so I just, I think there's a lot of hidden stress here that results in um, disease and sickness. And I, I think that there is a lot of hope because we're, we're learning so much more about this. And, you know, what we talk about in my community a lot is sometimes just having the words to talk about what you've been through is extremely healing. And mm. so I do have a lot of hope. And I think that it's going to, like, I see a positive future for the, the progression of us being able to talk about and define autism, especially in women. And so I think we can kind of reverse or kind of circumnavigate this, uh, these challenges. But yeah, I, I have a lot, of, a lot of thoughts about how it's passed on and what kind of legacy that leaves. So this is a really interesting question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, mm. but actually, there's got another question on Facebook. This might be a good one to... Um... From Andrea. And then I have to hop out in just a couple minutes, but I, yeah, I don't want to ruin the party. But how should how should teachers approach a situation, or how should people approach a situation where they they're quite certain that a student or someone they know could be uh, autistic, but the parents, you know, or loved ones, kind of dismiss it? Is it appropriate to suggest it directly to the person, or what should happen? I get this question a lot, actually, from more from partners and stuff. Like, I think my partner is, how should I tell them? I always find this a really hard question to answer. What do you guys think? My experience, and again, it's like, I always give caveats because it depends on the person. It depends on the relationship. It depends on so many things. But I think a, a good first approach is maybe not to use, not that there's anything inherently shameful about using the word autism, but a lot of people have a misunderstanding of that. So can you come at it from a different place, like sensory overwhelm, social anxiety, repetitive behaviors, if you can use any of that language first and you can kind of gauge if the person is open to hearing more about that, you can kind of gauge where they're at based on using that kind of terminology before you suggest autism. Um, and again, not that there's anything inherently shameful in using that word, but it can be helpful to kind of put a feeler out and see where that other person is coming from, if that makes sense. I would say based on personal experience from my daughter working in a preschool, that there are cultural differences um, in regard to uh, mental health issues. And not that autism is a mental health issue, but that that's how they perceive it. Um, but I also have experience on how my son was diagnosed, which was his teacher telling us that she saw signs of autism in him. And she uh, did not downplay it. And she didn't use any like sensory issues terms or anything like that um she just straight out told us the autism and my husband and i were both offended at first mm. um mm -hmm. because we knew nothing about it so i think that if you are just direct uh people can accept it or reject it i don't know that and uh, it like kind of like orion was saying earlier um you know, that we are all different minds with different opinions. Um, I think culturally, maybe that slow stepping would help some people. You would have to have a really good intuition to figure out who that would be. But I know that for my son, his teacher just straight out told us, have you ever had a evaluated for autism? And that started the whole journey, and we were offended at first, and then we looked into it and understood a lot more about it, and um, the rest, as they say, is history. So that's my input. Easy. And then there were three. <laughs> now, now, Claire, um, did you want to um, talk about? Um, I've forgotten the question. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it was about telling, like, telling someone directly if you think or you suspect, and how that could be a tricky situation. I, uh, I mean, I think I've spoken about it on my channel before. Um, it is a tricky situation. I don't, uh, I don't think you should call somebody out on it personally. Um, sometimes I'll for like if I get to know somebody, um, I I'll forget sometimes, and I'll just make an off the cuff comment, and they'll be like, "Excuse me, uh, don't do that." I think. Uh, <laughs> I think the best thing is to uh, bring it up with somebody if uh, you have a, a good friendship. I, I would bring it up privately. Uh, I would 
bring some information with you. Um, maybe, hey, have you seen some of these videos that kind of reminded me of you? Is this something you've ever thought about before? Uh, because um, I know that for me, I had no earthly idea that, um, which now seems so weird because, I mean, I, you know, check the boxes, right? But I had no earthly idea that I, I was on the autism spectrum. I thought that this is how everybody, I, I mean, I knew that not everyone was like me, but I thought that, I mean, must, this must be how other people experience life. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think it should be done in a, a trusting way, in a private way. Um, I don't think it's necessarily helpful most of the time, uh, even if you can, or you suspect, um, that somebody is on the spectrum. I, I don't think it's helpful most of the time to just, Hey, just met you thought you should know. Bye. I don't think that's usually helpful. So. Like a call me maybe type song. Um, uh, I feel like now and we might be able to um, look more into the comments too. People are saying, is, is, are all answers going to be sung now, Claire? Is that something you're going to be doing? I can't make any, uh, I can't uh, confirm nor deny. What about the, um, I was going to ask you about, so here's the thing, right? I'm, we're going into winter here in the Southern Hemisphere. You're going into summer in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and uh, tell us what, what's what's the deal now? Uh, so beanies, yes. Nude summer headgear. Well, how? What's the? What do you do to prepare for the warm? You want to show us or tell us? Like, are you making something well, that, different? I mean, we don't we don't need to talk about that necessarily. I mean, that's really kind of you to shout my. I I mean, I do Etsy as a way to help support myself, and I normally uh, do like uh, beanie hat drops, as you guys know. Right now, I'm like looking more into like like uh, head scarves. We're working on some things like that. So I've been trying to think of things that people would wear in the summer. So it's kind of, I mean, we just launched we as an I uh, as an entity. Just launched the Etsy last year. So this is my first time having it during the summer. So we're kind of ex work as an I exploring that. Actually, there's some people um, I've got here who are obviously in Oz, like in Queensland and in all the different places. And so Trey said that it's cold here in Queensland. We wear beanies and track pants and jumpers. So they could actually go to your Etsy shop and um, and get some, some nice warm Yeah, lots to choose beanies. from on the shop right now. And uh, I will let you guys know, I have, I have shipped hats to more than just Orion in Australia, but also, Orion has the largest collection of Woodshed Theory merchandise on the continent. I mean, that's something, right? The continent, yeah. the entire continent. I've got a bright green one. Um, yes. That's, and I've got Thanks, this one. Thanks, guys. That's so kind so, of yeah. you to shout out my endeavors. Okay, so I actually think that this one is a pretty good one. Um, it's by Grace Brooks. And she says, even if even clinicians struggle, so this is a little bit deeper, so get your thinking caps on. If even clinicians struggle to discern between level one autism and ADHD, how can we ensure the diagnosis is accurate and does it even matter? Would it be better to just fold them into one group and discuss support needs or is it super important to know? Obviously, we're trying to lump level one autism and ADHD together. And I do think that those have some very distinct properties. And one of them can be treated with medication and the other one cannot. Um, but I'm open to hearing what you guys have to say about that. I, I think there's even like, aside from just trying to discern between level one autism and ADHD, because I do think that there are quite a few distinctions there. Clinicians do have, depending on their training, struggles differentiating between autism and ADHD because you've got the hyperfocus issue where you have mm. a kid may have inability to be pulled away from something in a hyper focus or they are uh too focused on it you know um so there are some so a lot of crossover a lot of similarities and overlap um but 
the bigger issue here, I think, that we can kind of discuss is that there are a lot of mental health professionals out there who still don't understand how to diagnose this stuff in general, and that um, it is especially more difficult with adults. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you can't trust the experts, who can you trust, I guess? Being granular is important when it comes to talking about how to best support people. I think in my mind that is where it becomes important because maybe uh, someone who has ADHD or autism or both, they all have different support needs. So in my mind, um, even though there are so many similarities, I think somebody just mentioned comorbidities that have a lot of the same uh, outward presentations um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are all uh, equate to the same thing. So in my mind, it is important to distinguish the two. Um, but then on the other hand, it's also important to um, have more research where they are um, to kind of uh, pinpoint where do they overlap? Like where should we be lumping them in together? And where are where are the differences? But I do think that they there should definitely uh, there's nothing wrong with being more granular and explaining things uh, more particularly. That's that's how I feel about it. Uh, only seven hours to go um, before we wind this up. <laughs> so uh, thank you for being here. A lot of people really like that question, Jen. That's why I regretted not listening to anything that just happened in the last five minutes. I apologize. I was watching the comments. Um, I think we were talking about ADHD and autism. A lot of people are saying they're very two distinct things and other people are saying, you know, they, they, they're very similar and some were saying that one led to the other diagnosis. So I think this is a really fascinating conversation to have um, with all, you know, co-occurring conditions. Um, and we always talk about this, like, in videos and things, how the percentages just say that the chances of this linked with autism seem disproportionately higher for you know for autistic people so it's a really um, fascinating um, conversation about co-occurring conditions um, mm -hmm. not only the co-occurring conditions so it's just like um, also that there are a lot of mental health professionals who aren't really educated specifically in autism especially as it presents with you know adults uh, because they're still operating off of the Leo Kenner and um, Hans Asperger uh, definition of what autism looks like, which was very externally observable traits based. And, um, you know, I've been looking at the chat and there's been a lot of people that say that we know ourselves best. And mm. so there is a lot of truth to that um, in that, you know, a lot of us research and uh, we discover a lot about ourselves and we feel it very deeply before we go to seek a diagnosis. And um, we do know ourselves best. So I think 90% of the time when people walk into a clinician's office, they already know which diagnosis to a degree they're probably going to get because um, they didn't, you know, take time off of work and seek out a therapist or a mental health professional to seek a diagnosis because, you know, there's nothing going on. Um, hmm. However, however, there are some times where we might be reading things online that are crossover or overlap for other conditions like CPTSD or, um, you know, some form of childhood trauma or, um, you know, other, other types of things that we might, there is a possibility. So we do know ourselves best. However, there could be instances where we are reading information off the internet where there's a lot of crossover and CPTSD mm -hmm. or, auto, or ADHD is a, a lot of crossover there where we are um, maybe getting it wrong 
And if we have a really good mental health professional, they might be able to steer us in the correct direction. Because I actually asked the uh, professional that diagnosed me, like, how often do people walk into your office and think they have autism and walk out with another diagnosis? Because I was really trying to validate my own diagnosis. And she said, probably there might be about 10% of people who walk in my office thinking that they have one thing and walk out with another. So I guess that's a long way of saying that, yes, we do know ourselves best, but that there are a lot of crossover with a lot of these conditions. But then again, you go to the professionals and you expect them to know what they're talking about. And a lot of times they don't. And it is why we have so many horror stories out there of people going in to talk to a professional and the professional tells them, well, you can't be autistic because you were able to look at me. You can talk. You can complete sentences. You went to university. You went to uni. Uh, nope. Nope. You can't be autistic. So that's a struggle. Um, and so I would say that if you are going to try to seek out a diagnosis, you try to find somebody who really uh, is an expert in autism or ADHD. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of this to say, I don't know what, like uh, experts, experts can get it wrong, but we can too sometimes. That's, that's, a, that's an experience that I think many people late diagnosed um, relate to. I mean, I think people in the chat, you know, when I talk to you guys, when I have conversations, we all seem to have very similar experiences or stories. Um, I mean, you know, obviously my story really coming from seeing a psychologist for struggling with what seemed like overwhelming anxiety. And one of the first things the psychologist, you know, said in the conversation was, you know, have you ever considered, you know, uh, autism? Um, and of course, you know, that was um, offensive. It's like, what do you, I've come here to get help with those anxiety, mate. Can you just shut up and get onto the help me with anxiety? Um, and then you see, you know, a doctor and a, and a referral and a psychiatrist. And, you know, this is, this is the issue too. It's, it's not uh, finding someone who's not only qualified legally, so they're a doctor, but um, actually has the educational, um, you know, um, knowledge, up-to-date knowledge. It's all, it's almost um, not possible, unrealistic. So it's very hard. Um, I mean, the first psychiatrist I got um, specialised more in kids. Um, so I really had no idea about autism in adults. And, 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 you know, you can imagine everything you just said, Jen, is the kind of things I heard. Um, but then when I finally worked out, okay, you've really got to find psychiatrists who actually have some sort of, you know, educational interest in adult assessment. Um, mm. And that's hard to find. And then when you do that, you know, they're like, I can't believe this other person, you know, missed this or said this. It's, it just, it, it, you know, it seems so much more obvious to them. But um, again, I think not only is it really hard to find people that know what they're talking about, um, but also it's, it's really hard too if you have your your mindset on something like if I'm focused on anxiety and someone brings up autism you know or you're focused mm -hmm. on ADHD you know and someone brings up autism or, or vice versa it, that's very hard to get your head around and then the challenge is and this is a big challenge for me as a parent too is how many how many more things do we want to lump on this kid right how many more diagnoses labels whatever you want to call it does the kid need right like as in is it helpful? What what point do you reach the point where it's no longer helpful? You know, like so they've got this and that, autism, ADHD, mm -hmm. and anxiety, and OCD, and and um, depression, or, or you know, like, and I don't know the answer. I think if you can get acknowledgement to things that you experience, and there's ways to navigate through that, right, to make it um, to help you, that's great. But for me, that's the thing I'm navigating right now. At what point do you stop? Right? It's like. Uh, it's mm. it's really tricky. Yeah, somebody I... says um, anxiety to autism, huge leap. And that's actually not true. Because when you're living with um, autism, like anxiety on its own is its own separate diagnosis. But there is like a lot of like um, anxiety, like uh, I, I think 80% of people who have autism also have anxiety from trying to interact with the world and that doesn't mean that anxiety is an indication for autism like it's not a diagnosable criteria but it is a result of having autism because we mm -hmm. have so much anxiety about interacting with the world 
every single day. I was just thinking about what Orion said about when do you, you know, like when is it too much to like stack onto somebody? And it was kind of making me think about how we um, have these negative feelings towards some of these diagnoses. I think that's when it becomes, I, I think that's when they start there starts to be a question of like, well, how many more? Like, what's too much? When will it be? I think maybe what needs to happen is starting to shift getting these diagnoses into a, something that's way more positive and, and a good thing. And then, well, then we can kind of move away from this idea of um, that it's going to hold people back. I think from having, the, having too many diagnoses might hold someone back when for me what my diagnoses have given me is is um a lot of freedom and understanding but i understand what you're saying like because we have this conversation a lot right um how you don't know how how your life would have been different if you had known all of this when you were a kid right yep. um and and we'll never know that um i just hope my hope is that in as we have more awareness and understanding and ha as our community steps out into its own light um, more strongly each year as the research grows stronger, um, that that it will turn. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, it's always beautiful and happy and whatever, that there's no negatives, but I, I hope that it would be less of a negative. Yeah, co-occurring conditions can be, can lump on more negativity. That's the issue too. I mean, depending on what they are. Um, right. And, and certainly for kids, yeah. Um, it's, I mean, adults obviously, but you know, when you're kind of raising a kid and it's like, you know, if we, That's we, tough. we start to label on more, how will that impact that person that comes down to it? So I always think, what will this achieve with regards to helping them, right? Like, yep. mm, is it mm -hmm. just a label or is it something that will, will open up access to services and help? And the thing is, I get this question a lot about, you know, diagnosis as a kid or an adult. Um, the, the, I think the fact of the matter is it wouldn't have made no difference because when I was a kid back in the early 1940s, there would not have been any good quality services, yeah? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I, what do you mean? What did I miss out on? Nothing, right? I missed out on nothing because because I wasn't what they were looking for and there wasn't services to help those types of people. Uh, potentially, I mean, unless I think the diagnosis would have been like um, in infantile schizophrenia. Um, so what would have it, then what would have that given me, right? So, you know, this is the, this is the issue. Um, mm, people always mm -hmm. look back and go, my life could have been so much better. But it's like, no, nah, probably not. I mean, <laughs> like the services are pretty crap now and I go through them with my kids, my kids, sorry. Um, that always, I find that really strange. Um, but then I also can feel this frustration of people in the chats, in the comments, you know, it can cost them hundreds of dollars, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars per session for someone who's classed themselves as an expert and then is they find out to be very bad at what they do. Um, that's a massive mm. amount of money to throw away. Um, misdiagnosis, you know, undiagnosis. Um, and I think it's fair enough to say that you're going to run into even more barriers um, as, as a woman. But, you know, uh, the, this is the issue, clearly, um, access to services and, and expertise. Um, and then, like, we, like we've talked about, it, it's helpful to know that I have clinical anxiety, like I have diagnosis of clinical anxiety, if that is something that I can get help with. But I'm not necessarily, I'm not necessarily sold on if the medication I take is, is doing that much. Like I'm still pretty rattled most days. So it's more of a something I can use as a, okay, I understand what, like you said, Claire, I understand myself better. This is why I'm experiencing this. What can I do to help myself? Um, and I think the challenge is for most people that I talk to is, yeah, but the, the people don't care. Like your family and your mm. friends or the community, they don't give a shit if you've come, you know, yesterday, nothing. Today, you've got these labels now. Like, we, but you, you know, what, whatever, man. What do you want me to do? Change? Like, you know, it's a... Mm. Especially mm. when they've known you your whole life and it can be hard for them to believe a diagnosis when you've been masking your whole life. I will say though that um, I want to shout out because I know there's probably family members in the chat too who think, well, that's not how I was. I was really accepting and we made some changes. I know a lot of um, yeah. parents out there 
So just shout out to all of those people who uh, heard about a diagnosis and said, what can I do? Thank you for that. 100%. 100%. I think like this, it would be a great opportunity to like read some of the chats going on. Yeah, 100%. There's some great comments too. I got a comment. Someone actually asked, um, I think it's um, Fran, Franimus. I can't, I'm so bad with these things. Um, talking about uh, an autistic friend who's headed into uni and coming to grips with uni and being autistic and advice um, in that respect. Or even, I guess that, that's the same with, with advice to any kind of level of education, whether you're doing it with a child or yourself. That's a big question. Um, get that a lot. I think from my point of view, one of the core issues for autistic people in certainly in higher education is if you are able to access any kind of supports, they tend to focus on the assessment part um, mm -hmm. which I find, you know, kind of unsatisfactory only on the premise that giving me an extra 10 minutes um, in my exam because I'm autistic won't help me if you've provided no supports for me to learn the content I'm being assessed on. That's all I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. I would say do not be afraid um, to, if, if there are um, services available, don't be afraid to access them. Like I wish uh, that I had been able to access more time or taking exams alone. Um, I, I wish that I had been able to take more advantage of that. Um, and I wasn't diagnosed, so I wasn't able to. Um, I think uh, being able to go into university knowing your diagnosis or knowing that you're on the autism spectrum is, is a good thing because it will change how you um, how you work and how you need to be communicated with. And I think sometimes in, in college, depending on where you go, it could be more hands off. And uh, that's not always the best for somebody who's neurodivergent. They might need more uh, structure. Um, so being able to work, work with that information and, and work with services to get the structure that you might need, I would really encourage anyone to do that if, if it's available. I'm okay. good for the next six hours. Let's go. God help me. Okay. <laughs> um, what's happening now, Jen? Help me here. Um, okay. We're working. We're on. Okay. Oh, I've never seen it on such a old faulty product before. It's, Shut your mouth. <laughs> it looks horrific. It looks quite horrific. Didn't know they made those in the early 80s. But anyway. At least I wasn't born in the 1940s. Let it That's be known true. that that did I was born not. That. <laughs> it, it's kind of funny because I feel like that kind of like just glossed over a lot of people. And I'm sitting there like, did you just say 1940s? <laughs> Taylor, thank you for sending me a, a, um, a poll. Of it. I'm actually still going. Uh, we're actually still going. Um, we're still streaming. Claire's gone. It's just me and Jen. Um, can you hold the polos until I've finished the stream? Thank you. All right. All right. She um, sent me one before she sent you one. I just want you to know. So. No, that was the group one. She sent oh, you a direct one. one group? I got yeah. a direct one. I'll get stuff. That's a lot of rubbish. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe because I'm nicer to her. Okay. Whatever. What did she say? Hey, how did you watch it if we're on the stream? Have I you didn't it? watch it. Oh, I just okay. got a notification. So um, making fun and sarcasm is my love language, but that is not for everybody on the spectrum, but that is because I also have the ADHD. So I'm all about it. I'm all about the teasing. I'm all about the silliness. Um, but I definitely know that that's not everybody. But anyways, Orion gives me a hard time about my... Uh, equipment because the very <laughs> first time i know that sounded bad <laughs> the very first time we did a uh interview i did it off of a 20 year old laptop that had no sound quality whatsoever and so for this one i was asking like well can we hop on from our phones and um he was like yeah Everybody was like, oh, Jen's going to be an 8-bit. And I was like, look, you guys, just because I have a flip phone to attend this live stream in doesn't mean that I I won't be there. I'll be there, okay? E a for effort. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I don't know if it actually is more specific to to autistic people, but because um, it's it, 
Claire is very similar and, and you and I. Uh, I also think, and it's very much my personality, um, if I'm making, like if I'm making fun of you, giving you crap, whatever you wanted to call it, teasing, whatever, making jokes, um, that's a sign um, that I'm, give, I'm actually, I actually, you know, like you enough to waste my time on you. Like as in, if I'm not giving you crap, if you're not getting teased by me or I'm not giving you crap, that's a good sign that I'm, you know, I'm not so much <laughs> there. Um, so maybe it is, maybe it is more of a unique thing. Maybe it isn't as unique as I thought. Maybe it is a kind of a, a neurodivergent thing, but, um, and maybe it isn't, but I definitely um, do that a lot. I mean, I, I just assume that, um, Jen, when, you know, you understand I'm joking, but I just assume a lot, well, I do constantly tease and make fun. Um, but I think that's, that is very natural to us. So it maybe mm -hmm. is more of a, um, the, a different brain kind of thing. I'm not sure. Um, but another uh, thing uh, I'll say is that yeah, like, yes, yes. I know that like, um, you know, Claire and, um, Tay get very like drained with the live streams. And for me, this is kind of the only interaction I get, to be honest with you. And it actually kind of like gives me energy and um, energizes me. So I appreciate everybody that's been here um, and chatting and giving their input. It's pretty awesome. Well, then prove it and do something. Um... <laughs> well, I came with my hat on. Like I was going to do the impression, but um, I don't think. Oh, you the, came uh, back as me. I didn't even see it. You came back as me. <sighs> I did. That's awesome. But, okay. Yeah. Two Orions in one. <laughs> More Inception. Um, anyways, I do think that this was a great stream and we have proved now that we can do several people and so maybe we should kind of wrap it up now people are asking questions um do you like dark humor or crude humor i i feel like i'm just like a sarcastic humor type of person um i don't know about you ryan like i'm not a huge fan of like dark too dark humor i'm a little bit of a sissy then i, then I like dark humor very much <laughs> um, would be my answer. It's just the so, opposite yeah. of whatever I pick. Is that what's going so, on here? I like sarc I like sarcasm and dry wit, but I think I, I I like dark humor on the premise that I like to make you know jokes that people go like too soon or whatever. Like I think that's because it, it, it's ne I don't believe it's ever too soon. If one thing is is the perfect timing, it's making people laugh. Um, so yeah. I, I maybe we all think about it in a different way. What what is dark humor? But I I think I like that kind. Of, I I think I am relatively dark, um, dark sarcastic. But it was great to have so many people here. It's been a massive success, I reckon, Jen. Yes, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I don't want to get too cheesy, but seriously, I know that when we have these um, panels, you know, and we all talk to each other, and we don't get to everybody's comments. Um, but I personally, I know Ryan's going to say like, he will never go back and watch the live stream, but I personally go back and watch what everybody has said. So whether we read your comment out loud or not, um, I usually go back and read everything and I am just so grateful and appreciative that all you guys were here and I hope that you get something out of it. And again, I'm being super cheesy here, but I hope that you guys all feel less alone um and more seen because i know that that's part of the reason why ryan and i are doing this we're obviously trying to raise the level of appreciation and awareness <laughs> but you know honestly i just want you guys to feel less alone and more seen and i just think you guys are the bees knees i love and appreciate all of you um so that's my thing didn't work, didn't work. hopefully <laughs> i didn't uh, check the live chat replay box then that will work out much better, better for me um, hopefully i didn't check it i don't know if i did i'm sorry don't get huffy puffy how would i know i can't i couldn't even get the link right you think i can check check, check the right box i can't even say the word check i'm saying check the right box i can't get the link right i'm gonna check the right box and then start getting really agitated and really fiery here people so just whatever you do don't give me any 
don't give me any crap, okay? Because you know, there's a guy called James, James of the Y. He made a bing, set of bingo cards that have things that I do in live streams that he could tick off as a go. And I don't think I've got any ticked off today, so he's you're very lucky. Um, anyway, you, there's you a bingo. Did. You, I can't keep yeah. up with the live stream. That was number one thing you did. Okay. Well, no one got me to rant about things. So, and and Taylor even mentioned cupcakes. So that that didn't set off a rant on cakes. So everyone's very lucky, because um, of course we all know that uh, this is just bloody disgusting. Cupcakes, cakes, whatever they are, just get I just almost, piss off. I almost said something about it, but I was like, nope. Keep it quiet. Yeah, like, <laughs> nah, I'm not interested. Just p- piss it off and get me something that actually is tasty. Like seriously. Um, anyway. Here we go. People are going to start ranting about how they make great cakes. Yeah, you know, go slap your mama. That's what I would say to you. Um, I don't even know what that means, by the way, but just do it. You want? You got a good cake? Slap your mama. I don't want to hear about it. You see what I'm saying? Like just up your, up your, up your, you go off your trot. Seriously, you got a good cake? Put great. your manners back in. <laughs> hey, that's. I was told slap. That's a good thing to do. Anyway, it's honestly just slap your mama, mate. Yeah, tell her it's good. Imagine it. Imagine if I did that in Australia, I'd go to jail. Like, oh, you know what? This dinner was bloody delicious, Mum. Crack! Like, seriously, what in the world? Where are we living? How was how was dinner, boys? Bloody great. So, I just said it was good. You down there, coming up. She's she's asleep. She'll be back. She's in, gone into concussion protocol for the next two weeks. She can't play. All right. Um, good. Yes. Okay. So everybody prepare to say goodbyes. And please, we don't promote violence on this channel. Please do not slap your respective slap your mama. mamas. Okay? Unless, of course, it's, it's a metaphor. Um, <laughs> all right. Good. Thanks. Appreciate it. Love you um, guys very much. I loathe you and Say tolerate goodbye, you. Orion. Um, all right. All right.